Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on programming in Go. So, in this segment I want to talk about Go's PProf tool. Okay, it's a profiling tool and I want to show you using it to find leaking Go routines and then we'll take a look at performance, actually looking at CPU performance and how we can tweak the performance of a program and see that in the profiler. So I'm going to start in the laptop and talk about a program we've seen before. It's a program that goes out to Tipicode's JSON testing service, right? We're going to go out and get a to-do. And we showed it before in another exercise where we turned it into some other kind of JSON or we showed it on a web page using a template. Okay, this time I'm just going to print it out. I could do it on the command line with curl. In fact, let's go do that. All right. So I'm going to curl localhost and give it to do number one, and it's going to print out something, and to do number two, and to do number three. We're going to kill it and restart it before we go on, because I want to show you the profiler, and I want to start with it with nothing going on. Okay? So let me just reload that. So this is what you get when you look at the profiler. You get the whatever your URL host is, slash debug slash pprof. And you get these choices. Now the one we want to look at right now is GoRoutine. It says there's four GoRoutines. And if we look at that, all right, we're going to see what they are and where they are. Okay? And not surprisingly, one of these should be our listen socket. All right? So somewhere down here we have listen and serve. There we go. All right? Starting out of main. Okay, and we probably have at least one Go routine just because we're running PFROF also. Fine, so this is this program. It's got four Go routines. Okay, and now I want to go back and I'm actually going to run a script. I've got a little script here and it's going to run a bunch of curls in a row. Or it would if I typed the name right. Okay, now it just ran nine queries, and I want to go back to my pprof output. So we'll go back one, reload that, and we're now up to 13 Go routines. We had four, we're at 13. We ran nine queries. Hmm, must have locked up nine Go routines somehow. And if we go and drill down at the Go routine, we're going to see, well, there's nine of them. And where are they? Well, they're hanging out on a net puller. Okay. So, I've told you before, the number one way you leak memory in Go is to leak a Go routine, and one of the two ways you can leak a Go routine is to leak a socket. And if we go back and look at the code, we're going to find out that I didn't close the body of the request that I sent to Tipicode, right? I go out to Tipicode, get some JSON, read the body, decode the JSON, and I never close the body. And the socket gets hung up. And so the number of Go routines keeps going up, right? And if I fix that, that wouldn't happen. All right? So this is one way. And I'm going to show you another in just a second. But I want to mention, you know, there's two ways to find out you have a Go routine leak. One is you run your program, and eventually it dies because it runs out of memory. The other way is you build your program, and as part of your testing, you run some traffic, and you look at tools like pprof to see how is my program behaving. Right? Do the number of Go routines just keep going up? And particularly when you run some traffic and then stop, right? Where are your Go routines then? You may have a few, a few extras here and there because of various things that are in your service. But if the number of Go routines keeps going up and up and up, and then you stop traffic and it just stays there, and then you run some more traffic, it goes up and up, okay? You probably have a Go routine leak, and you're going to be able to find it because you're going to see, for example, okay, in this case, again, it's stuck on a net puller. Okay. If it were hung up on a channel, we would see that differently, and you could, try, you could look at that and find that. Okay, so this is one way to find a Go routine leak, and I want to show you a second way that's a little different. So I'm going to skip from pprof to something called Prometheus, and Prometheus is a metrics package that's popular for cloud software. It's going to give us another endpoint that's going to show us some statistics about the program. So hold on just a sec. All right. And in fact, I've already got it in this version of the code. I just didn't show it. I'm pulling in. So to get pprof, first off, 
we did a underscore include of the pprof package. Now, why do we do put the little underscore at the front of this line? Is because we don't use anything out of pprof. We're just including it so that it binds itself as a route, okay? And it does that because we're using the standard library, okay, down here. We're just using the standard library stuff, okay? If we weren't, if we were using Gorilla Mux, we'd have to do a little bit extra, an extra step to get that bound in properly against the Gorilla router. Okay. Anyway, let's go back up here. I've pulled in a couple of packages from Prometheus. One of them is going to be used to define metrics, and the other one's going to give us a handler that we can bind in that will give us a route to scrape the metrics from. Okay. And if we look down here in my code, somewhere down at the bottom of my handler, I've got this queries.inc increment call. All right, so that means I've defined it somewhere. And sure enough, down here, I've got queries as a variable. It's a new counter from Prometheus. And in this case, it's just a simple counter. It's not a distribution. Now, this is one way I used init to do Prometheus much register. That might not be the best way, and particularly in a simple program. You know, there's no reason I couldn't just move it up into the main and put it in the main program, okay? Um, because I don't have any other files or packages or whatever. Right. And then the last thing I do is I actually add the metrics handler, and I just call the prom HTTP package handler function gives me the handler that will handle metrics and basically display them. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. So I have this program, and what I want to do, first of all, is I want to kill the local one, and I'm going to run it in a Linux virtual machine. All right, so I'm going to upload it using Vagrant to my virtual machine, and then I'm going to get into my virtual machine and run it there. Now, and it turns out, okay, so if I look at this, I have main.go here, and we'll try that again. Okay, now it looks like it's running, or at least it didn't complain. Oh, wait a minute, now it's downloading all the stuff it didn't download. Okay. So I didn't build it before in my virtual machine. I should have done that. But now it's going to download this stuff and start running. Okay. And it's listening. Now, it says it's listening on 8080. But I'm running VirtualBox to run Ubuntu. And I've mapped this port 8080 in the virtual machine to my port 8088. Okay. So now I'm going to come over here to 8088 and hit 1 excuse me, 8888, okay, and it's doing what it's doing. And if I hit debug slash pprof, it's doing that. But now I have another tool here. I have metrics. And this is what you get back when you hit the metrics endpoint with Prometheus, all right? You get a bunch of statistics. And it's interesting because you not only get some machine statistics like, you know, the CPU usage, you're going to get a bunch of stuff about Go, right? So I get the one that I added. I called it all underscore queries. I've already hit it once because I just did the one query. And I put it at the top by naming it that way, right? I named it something starting with A so it would be at the top, right? I can see the number of Go routines, right? We'll see that go up. I can see the version of Go I used to build with, right? And then I can see a whole bunch of stuff about memory usage and garbage collection and so on. And then I can get down to things about the operating system, right? How many threads are there? CPU seconds. How many FDs can I open maximum? 1,024. How many of them are open right now? And this statistic or metric is the reason I'm running this in Linux. Because if you run your program with Prometheus on your Mac laptop, you will not see the process open FDs by default, okay? The, the Mac version of Prometheus doesn't do that because it's not as easy to get that number as it is to get it on Linux. All right? That's why I'm showing Q running in Linux because now it's there. It shows me 12. So I'm going to run my little script. I'm going to modify it first real quick um, because I need to okay. I need to change all these 8080s.
to 8888. Replace all, save, get rid of you. And now I should just be able to run that. And it ran, but now it's running against my other machine. All right. And so if I refresh this, now all queries went from 1 to 10 because I ran 9 more. Okay. And my Go routines went from 10 to 19. Okay. And most interesting, if I scroll down here, is what happened to my OpenFDs? Well, it went up 9 also to 21. All right. So this is another way, without even using pprof, if you have a metrics package like this, you can see, are my Go routines going up? And if they're going up and your open FDs are also going up, then you can be sure you're leaking sockets. Okay? If the open FDs aren't really changing but the Go routines are going up, then it's probably a Go routine bug. All right, so I've just showed you a couple ways to find leaking Go routines using pprof or using a, a metrics package like Prometheus. Okay, now for something completely different. I want to show you a program I wrote that animates a couple different sort algorithms. Okay, I'm going to talk about it for a minute and then we're going to look at it in the browser and we're going to look at it with CPU profiling. So, first of all, I have insertion sort and some different variations of quick sort. And I'm not going to get into the details of how they work, but you'll see them animated here in just a sec. All right? It's going to create a big animated GIF. Okay? I think today we're using the word GIF and not GIF. Maybe today we should be using GIF and not GIF. I don't know. You tell me. Anyway, we're going to do this as a big picture, and we're going to use a standard library package to produce the result. It could be animated. We have a choice of looping or not looping, all right? But it's going to certainly animate how it goes through the rows as it's sorting. And it's going to be 1,024 elements in the array, so it's going to be 1,024 pixels wide. Well, not pixels, actually, squares. We're going to do multi-pixel squares so it's visible. All right. And that means it's going to be 1,000 columns deep. Okay. Now, to run pprof, actually to use the pprof output, we've got to build a binary. So the usual thing we do where we just say, go run the program, that's not going to work for us. Okay. We're going to have to go build. And I'll show that in a second. Then we run the program, run the profiling, and we'll have it capture a profile while we exercise the program. And then we'll look at what that profile tells us. All right? Now, to, to run it, we're going to hit the endpoint. I'm going to do it all through. There's, there's other ways to do this. You could do it through inserting some code in your program so when it runs, it generates a profile. I'm going to do it through the browser because, again, we're going to see the animation in a browser. So I'm going to use the profiler in the browser, and when I hit that, it's going to give me 30 seconds of data, drop it to a file on my disk that we can look at. But to look at it, we'll need to use this thing, GoToPprof. Right? Now, there's different ways to use the GoToPprof on the machine to look at the resulting profile. Okay? One is we can use it interactively, and I'm not going to show that. One is that we can use it with the dash top option, and it'll just say, hey, here are the top I don't know, 10, 12, whatever, functions by how much CPU they used. And the third choice is to actually open up a browser, and that's the neat one. Because in the browser, then, we can start looking at a flame graph, or we can start looking at a graph of the different things that are used, move around, zoom in and out. Okay. So I'm back in my laptop. As I said, I need to build the program instead of just running it. So I'm going to do go build, and now I can do dot slash sort, because it built a local program sort. And by default, it's going to use a slow way of animating. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. And now I'm going to come over here, and you can't really see the URL very well, but it's, I'm running this one on 8081, and it's slash insert question mark loop equals zero, because I'm not going to have it repeat the loop. We could do that. And what it's going to do, and on this machine, it's lightning fast it's going to generate an animation of insertion sort. I need to zoom out so that the whole square shows up. Okay. If you're familiar with a guy named Robert Sedgwick, 
Okay, he's a famous CS professor, teaches an algorithms class, has written several algorithms books in different editions and languages. His first book in 83 had a picture like this on the front cover. And so I finally decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and actually reproduce it. And this is it, right? As, as the insertion sort works its way from left to right, it's showing you each step top to bottom. So you start out with a random array, and when you get down to the bottom, it's a completely sorted array using the color. So each color has a value 1, 2, 3, 4. I've numbered them. And we're sorting based on those numbers and tying them to colors that look like a rainbow. Fine. Now, I can do that with insert. I've got a, a simple version of quick sort. It works a little differently. And it's actually going to go, in this case, from the top right and work down towards the bottom left. And it does it in blocks. So it's a lot less smooth. Okay. And generally speaking, it'll be a little quicker than the insertion sort, which means it won't need all of the columns to get done. And then I have, for example, a really fast one, which is how a real quick sort works. And it's over almost immediately. In fact, if I wanted to, I could add a delay parameter onto this and slow it down a little bit. And it still is pretty quick. All right, so that's the animation that I want to show you. And what we're going to talk about now is, well, how do we draw the picture, and can we make drawing the picture faster? Okay. Or actually, we're going to start with, well, where is the time spent in the program? And I just happen to know that the only thing I can control is how I draw the picture. All right, so let's go over to this. Okay, so I've restarted the program, and we're going to go now and look at PPROF. Okay, so it's nice and clean, except now instead of looking at these other things, we're going to look at profile. But if I hit profile, what it's actually going to do is start the profile. And so I don't want to do it manually. I'm going to do it with a script. I'm going to come over back to my things here. It's running here. Okay. When I hit this little script, it's going to start a profile, which will run for 30 seconds, download something. I'll move it back into my directory, and we'll look at it. And then I have another script. Okay. which is actually going to run a bunch of sorts. And so we'll run some CPU time. Okay, so there we go. Let's start you, and we'll start you. And if we go back and look at the logs, we'll see the logs are showing a bunch of things being done. All right. But what we're really waiting for now is for the profile script to say I'm done. And all it's doing is doing a curl against debug pprof slash profile. OK, so the profile is done. And now if I do an ls, I've got this profile. And I'm going to move it right now to another file just so I know where it is. All right. But I will now run the go tool pprof. OK, I need to give it the binary. And this is why we had to do the build. The binary is sort. And the profile is this profile slow. All right. And probably I need to give it the option back here. So we'll just do that. And what we're telling it to do is run a browser window. OK. And we will have a browser window into the GoTool pprof. And now we can look at this. There's, it starts us off in this basic graph view. There's some other choices. I want to show the flame graph real quick. right? And the flame graph shows most of the time is spent doing serve HTTP. And if we get down here, you know, here's the top level thing. And under that, we have various different handlers that we use to run different sort algorithms and how much they took. Okay? So that's interesting. We can look at top. Top is just the same thing we'd get on the console with the dash top option, right? And we're going to see high up on here, paint square slow, and we're going to look at that. But I want to go back to the graph, right? So the graph starts here. I guess when I, well, I think what I'm doing is scrolling and it's actually making it go up and down. All right, so up at the top are the handlers. And down here is like the, the handlers for different quick sort algorithms and, and the insertion sort. And they call the animate routine, right? 
And animate calls this thing paint square slow because I let it default to my slow option. And we'll talk about the different algorithms here in a second. Okay. And that in turn called a utility to do the setting the color index. So that's a pretty good part. On this laptop, it's actually more than some others. It's up to 27%, um, typically more like 20%. And what I'm not seeing right now, this thing should also be showing the time to, oh, I know why. Okay, I have somehow zoomed in on something I didn't want to. So let's go back to this general thing. And if we look at this, yeah. So under animate, um, under animate, besides these, which take a good bit of time, over here we have this whole encoding process, right? And the encoding process takes uh, not that much time on here. Okay, so it varies from machine to machine. I'm doing it on a different machine. The encoding didn't take a lot of time. Most of the time is being spent actually drawing the little squares, okay? And I can't change the encoding anyway, right? The, the encoding of the image that comes out to the browser is going through the standard library. But what I can change is my strategy for actually drawing the image that I'm gonna have encoded that you're gonna see. And that's what we're gonna drill into now and take a look at some of the choices about how that works. So I'm gonna be back in the slides for a bit because I think what I need to show there, I can show there better. All right, we've already seen how to get in the browser and look at the tools, and I'll show you some clips of those, same thing. The numbers may change a little bit on this laptop, but you know, we'll look at the laptop I was on. In fact, let me drill back. The laptop I was working with before, right, there was more time spent encoding, and the paint square stuff also took, I don't know, about 20% or so. On this laptop, it's taking actually a bit more. All right, so here's what we're doing. For each square in that animation, we've got a gray border around it and some color inside based on the value in the array, right? And we gotta draw that. And in my case, it's eight pixels wide, so it's 64 pixels, right? The square of that is how much we're drawing. And the initial approach to this, so in the slide, it's called paint square. It's actually paint square slow in the repo. And the repo is mat4biz slash go class profile. Okay, um, but anyway, Paint Square, the original version, uses an, a paletted image. Actually, all this code is going to use a paletted image, which is a standard library thing, and then code that. All right, and a paletted image is this image with a color palette, so the different numbers represent the colors out of a palette instead of just raw colors, which is fine because we're picking the color based on the value in the array we're sorting. Great. So we're coming down here and you know, almost all the work right now is being done down here in this call to set color index. Okay, and if we were to drill back down into our graph, we'd see a lot of time spent there. Right? So we're iterating over all the pixels of the square. Okay, this, this thing is just painting a square. So it's, you know, the Y is gonna go over eight times and the X is gonna go over eight times. And if we're looking over here, if we're looking at the edge, so x is zero or y is zero or x is scale minus one or y is scale minus one, we're gonna use color zero, which happens to be the gray that is the bounding box. Otherwise, we're gonna paint the color of the value of the array index. The, the color index, I should say, that's in the array that we sorted. Right? Now, what does set color index do? Well, the answer is it does more work than we need it to. All right? If we go and look at, at the actual implementation of this, the first thing it does is it does a check to see, is this pixel inside the rectangle of the image? Well, we're gonna do that a zillion times and I think that's redundant, so I don't think I need to do that. I can eliminate that piece of work. But the other thing it does is it's calling an offset function and it's doing a whole bunch of calculations, including multiplications every time. And I'm gonna argue, I think I can simplify that. And the reason I can do that is because thankfully, where the pixels are stored and a couple other values in here, they're all exposed. They're not hidden inside this palette image. So I can use them to write a slightly different version of this. So let's look at that, right? What can we do? Well, I just said we can un eliminate the unnecessary check, okay? 
we can do some of the multiplication outside of the loop. I'll explain that in a second. And then we can do a technique called strength reduction. The multiplication that we might have done inside the loop, we're going to be able to turn that into additions. And that'll be a cheaper operation. Right? And that's going to work because of the way the pixels are laid out. All right. The palette image keeps all of the pixels of the image in one big slice. And it's a slice of row after row after row. So if we think about moving in the x direction in the image, well, that's moving over one square. Okay. And if we want to move over the y direction, which is down the image, then there's this thing called stride. Okay. And we actually saw that in the code. It was right here, p dot stride, which is actually just the width of the column, the width of the row in terms of the actual image. All right. And so if you think about, here's what's actually being stored in p dot pix, but here's how we interpret that, right? Row after row after row, but in theory, when they show up, they're columns. And so if we look at these red spots, they actually show up as a stripe in the column. Right? Now, we can take advantage of that knowledge. What we want to do is find the upper left pixel of the square we're going to draw, and we'll have to do some multiplication to get there. Once we're there, we're not going to have to do so much work. So that brings us to paint square fast. Right? We're going to find the value of the color index from the array we're do working on, and we're going to calculate you know, the index of the pixel based on the scale. And scale here is, you know, I've got eight pixels, an eight pixel square for an item in the array. Okay, so scale is eight. And then px here is going to be this mythical top left pixel of the square. I've taken the calculation pretty much straight out of the standard library and moved it here. And once I do this, then the rest of the pixels I can find by either adding one to go x by x by x or adding stride to go you know, row by row down in the y direction. All right? And that's what I'm doing now. So if I think about it now, right, um, I've set up my index color for, the, for whatever I got out of the array, and then I'm changing it if I'm on the boundary, and now I'm just writing it in right here. Now my updated in a pixel is just an assignment. Okay, with an addition here, and when I'm done with the row, an addition of stride to get to the next row, moving downwards. Okay, so what does this behave? All right. And the answer is, it's about twice as fast. All right, by not doing all the multiplications and by not doing a certain check, I can get about twice the speed. Now, this is on the machine where it was 20% for the slow version. It's now about 10% of the CPU time for the fast version. So I've about doubled my time, or have the time in the function, or doubled the speed of it by making these changes. Well, there's more. Okay, now that I've done that, and you think a little bit more about what's going on, okay, I realize there's another change. Now I want to show one other thing um, before I go on. I've got this other slide. There's one more view in pprof I didn't show you. And that's the one where you can see the actual code, right? Let me, let's do this live. So I'll do this live in the laptop real quick, right? We have this view right here, and we have some other views. There's a view called source, okay? And source brings up paint square slow, and I can click on things, okay? Now it's still showing me the version from slow. I haven't run it on fast. But you can go down here and see where the time is line by line, right? And what I'm going to do now is let's just run this again. I want to run this again with speed faster, okay? And I'm going to run my profile script, and I'm going to run my script that runs the sorting. So let's start that, and start that. Okay, and then we're going to start up, we're going to move the profile thingy over, and we'll run this again. So we've got to wait 30 seconds. 
Images are done. Profile is done. Okay. So we're going to do this thing where we move it again. So now we'll call it Profile Faster, and then we'll go to Tool PProf with Faster. All right, now on this one, um, Paint Square Fast is substantially faster. It's still most of the work for some reason. But let's go look at the source. All right. Let's actually, hold on a second. It's very interesting. Let's go back to the graph for a second. Where is my encoding? You know, for whatever reason, it didn't capture the encoding, and I think that's why this number is so high. 61% of the time is spent in paint square fast. All right. Um, and I don't quite know why it's doing that. Other than possibly it's just the way it randomly captured the data. Okay, it's done other things when I've run it before for the slides. All right. So if I go to the source view over here, right, I can actually look and see how much time is being spent on certain lines, and I can actually even click on them, right? You can click on them and actually see what's being done, right? If I click on this one, I'm going to see some work being done to index into the slice and, oh, by the way, deal with the possible panic. And we're going to see that down here also, all right? There's a bunch of code down here not only to do the indexing, but to check and see if it needs to panic. And I'm doing that on every pixel. Well, so n squared bound rate checks that I don't think I need to do. And that's where a good bit of the time is going. So let me go back to the slides. And when we look in the, in the code, we're going to think about a couple things, right? I have the if then logic in the loop, but I have, I'm doing every pixel individually. So I'm still paying a bunch of work to do all the bounds checks because there's nothing in my code that's going to allow the compiler to eliminate the checking every time I index into the slice. Okay, and there's a bit of overhead to that. If I go back and think about my square, I don't have to draw it pixel by pixel. I can actually draw it from the top down row by row because the pixels of any given row are contiguous in memory. Right? So I really only have two situations. I have the top and bottom row, which are all gray, and I have all of these middle rows, which have a color on the inside pixels. And if I set those up, maybe I can do a copy. So let's try that. And in fact, here's my paint square fastest. Okay, I've got the same calculations at the top that I had to find the upper left corner, and then I've got one more calculation, and that's to find the lower left corner, okay? By adding up how many more rows do I have to go across to get to the bottom? And that allows me to do the top and the bottom once. So I'm going to make a little chunk of pixels, right? And I'm going to copy that chunk of pixels. Now, what do they start at? Well, they start at zero values. And what's zero is the color I'm using for the boundary, the gray. So I don't have to do anything. That empty, that slice that's not empty, it's a bunch of zeros. I'm just going to copy that here. And so suddenly, instead of doing bounds checks on every pixel, I'm only doing bounds checks to do these copies. All right. And then I'm going to come along and actually fill in the middle pixels with the color. And then I'm going to copy all the middle rows. And so I've just taken n square checks for boundaries on the slice, the pixel slice, and turned it into n, right? And that's going to be a good bit faster. And in fact, if we go look at that, on the machine I was working at before, paint square fast no longer even shows up on the critical path, right? On that machine, I started at 20%, then 10%. So I made it 2x with the faster version. And now I'm probably making it about 3 more x with the fastest version, OK? So I've actually got, I don't know, six 
6x speed up, 6 to 7x speed up by doing these changes. Now that was on the particular laptop I was using when making the slides. All right, and the laptop I'm on right now, I'm just running it once. And the numbers are a little different, it's a different laptop. Okay, but these numbers held up when I was developing the slides. I can run top on the command line, I'm just showing it here. Again, right, my paint square fastest is now down to about 3% of the work. Okay, and if I drill into this again with the source, and I'm not going to set it up and run it on the laptop right now, right, I'm going to see these things become a lot simpler. The time spent on those individual lines. Now, you may look at this and say, well, gee, let me go back here. You're allocating a slice. What does that do to the performance? And the answer is nothing because this slice does not escape. It's not going to be allocated on the heap. Okay, it's just another chunk of memory on the stack. So the cost of making it is basically zero. And so I, I don't have an allocation on the heap and I've got, you know, a handful of copy operations with built-in bounds checks. And that's 3x speed up right there, folks. All right, so I just eliminated almost all of the work that I can affect, which is drawing the squares. And what's left is the time to actually encode the image for browsing in the web. Okay, so that's me showing profiling a couple of programs. I showed using the pprof tool and also some metrics to find GoRoutine leaks. And then I showed you how to use the CPU profiling tool to look at where is the time being spent in my program and do the changes that I'm making actually make it faster. Now I could also have done some benchmarks. If you think back to benchmarking, I probably could have set up some benchmarks also and run them, but I wanted to show this in the profiler. And we took our little algorithm for drawing the animation and we made part of it, the part we could control, about six times faster.